I, uh, I'm the managing director of a company called Payments Cards and Mobile. It's involved in uh, publishing, research and consulting all in the payments industry. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you. There's a few more of you here. You're a little bit closer than I expected, but I will just try and get on with it. Um, the remit was uh, to do a Payments 101. Um, uh, and when I was trying to develop that storyline, um, I, I, even I got bored of it. So what I, what I did was, was sort of um, go off brief and, and try and come up with something that I thought was uh, both interesting and practical. Um, you, you and us sit on one side or the other of a particular fence. You have clients that you try and push towards the publishing side, and we, you know, we have clients who we, who we like to do marketing, and, and, we, and we meet at this point in the middle. And sometimes there's a frustration, probably on both sides. Um, on our side, that stuff that comes to us it, it isn't in, in the right way, and probably on your side, like, well, what are we supposed to do to get published in these magazines? So that, that, was, that was my sort of key criteria um, in doing this. It also was to try not to bore you too much, because the, the beginning early parts of payments is really Really dull. Um, Dan stole all the thunder by asking me after he did the stuff about fintech, so I can't really touch fintech. So that left me with um, quite a troubling proposition. Um, the first few slides I have stuck to my remit, and we'll, we'll start with those because I think they're quite interesting. And then after that, I'll go completely off target and see where we end up with. So there you go. That's the, that's officially the remit nailed. <laughs> officially the remit nailed. So um, uh, I, I like it because it does go through, and, and, and I, but the main thing is that the, the the middle part of those, aside from the pig and the and the contactless, it, everything was involved in cash, and. Um, 
you know, I wanted to, to, to spend some time on cash because it's, it's old and it's a payment form and it still exists. And, um, you know, there's some great stuff here about you know, going coinless, so not cashless, but coinless for 2020. You know, only 19% of payments in Sweden are, are with cash. Uh, and, you know, we hear about cashless societies all the time. And I, I, I've just got to tell you, it's complete rubbish. It's, it's really, really a long, 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 long way away. And, and I'll try and explain why. You know, when we look at Africa and Asia Pacific, it's nearly 100% still cash. So a cashless society by 2020 in Nigeria, which is something that's been mooted, it's not going to happen. When we look at the more developed markets, um, they're still massively cash-based. So all of these different technologies that we're seeing and promoting on both sides, yes, I agree that they're out there. Yes, I agree that there's a position for them. But when those guys come through your doors and say, we've got the latest piece of kit and we're going to be cashless and we're going to help the, the world do this, it's kind of like just temper that enthusiasm because when you see those things coming across on paper to an informed audience, it's, it's incorrect to say it. We're not going to be cashless by 2020. And, and even in the more developed markets, it's still a load of cash. you know. And, and here, for Sweden, for, for Africa to go from 99% cash, I don't know, to, to change that to 60% or even 50%, they can do that really, really quickly. It's easy because that kind of infrastructure that's going in now will help that happen very, very quickly. To go from the opposite position of 99% cashless to completely cashless, that 1%, that's the most difficult percent to, to nail. That's the one that takes the longest. And in my personal opinion, I don't ever see the society being cashless. We cannot be cashless, in, at my, in my opinion, at this time. And so that's... I just wanted to make that point because cash is here to stay. And there's some good reasons behind it. Oh, sorry, this one first. Um, yeah, so this is tracking uh, uh, the comparison of cash and circulation against the non-cash transactions per inhabitant. Now, this is in Europe. So uh, the figures are a little bit uh, old. But what you see is a sort of nice, gentle 4% rise. This is... This is good news for a really developed market. Right? Anyone that runs their own business or, 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 or um, a banker, etc., um, a 4% uh, increase year on year over that period of time is nice. The problem is, when we look what happened to the um, growth rate of cash over the same period of time, it's actually growing faster. The amount of cash in circulation is growing faster than the number of cashless transactions taking place. And this is in Europe a developed market heading towards a cashless society. So why is that? Well, this is from G4S. G4S is one of the biggest cash handlers in, in uh, certainly in Europe, but, but um, around the world as well. And they marked up a criteria of, um, of all of the uh, attributes of payments. And what we see across the top is that cash scores very well um, and that most of the other payment methods uh, don't score so well. In fact, debit and credit, which is probably our most uh, popular and um, used form in the UK, is not even legal tender. So um, what they don't show here is the kind of weighted average of what's important in a payment. And if we look at the two where debit, in this case, and credit score highly, it's convenience and it's efficiency. And on a weighted average, as consumers, as human beings, the two things that we value the most well, we, none of us really care that it's not legal tender, right? What we want is it to be efficient, and we want it to be convenient. And that's where it's being driven. So on a weighted average, these two points actually outscore a bunch of other stuff that's here. Um, up until about two weeks ago, we could have had a quite an interesting argument over reliability, I think. But as of what happened with, with Visa, and as of some of the other outages that we're starting to see as these um, platforms build up, you know, reliability of... Uh, a digital payment system could be called into question. Um, the point is that cash is here, uh, it works, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, so again, um, with keeping in mind that this is going to be put up and uh, used as a resource, I've put some stuff together. Listen, I know most of you know this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it. I want to focus on um, stuff like a CH debit pool, uh, credit and debit, and stuff like that. And then I think you can't really get away from wallets like PayPal and Bitcoin, but I'm really not going to spend too much time on that as we go forward. So um, the four-party payment system, I was specifically asked to deal with this. Um, here's a nice, here's a nice graph. Um, well, I think the simplest way to put the four-party system is this. Um, 
you have issuers and acquirers, and, and I hope I'll just take a second. The, the issuer is the bank or um, financial institution that puts a card in your hand. And in the 1990s, issuing was the sexiest part of the business, right? The fact that you could have a hologram on your card, the fact that they could emboss your name, you could have a picture of your dog, you could get that done in, in less than 48 hours. That was where all the money was pouring into. The banks were going mad. They just wanted to put those cards in your hand because they'd understood that there was a trend away from um, cash, that there was a trend of giving access to people's own money without them physically having to go into a, a bank and, and that there was a per transaction click fee that they could make off that and the more um, merchants they signed up on the acquiring side and the more uh, cards they got into your hand the more money they made effectively from that so issuing was where all the money was and acquiring is where all the money is now and we'll come to that in a second the way to explain this really simply is when you go traveling in India or you go partying in Ibiza or whatever and you want to buy that carpet or you want to buy that round of beers you walk into that merchant in India, you walk into that merchant in Spain, you, you quite literally don't care what it is. It's a, it's a swap of value. You're giving them your money and you expect to receive the goods in return. You don't care that in between all of that, somehow that Indian merchant receives funds from your English bank on a car that was issued by Barclays, as an example. And that's where the networks come in. And the point about the networks who have been, you know, given a, a bad time recently around, you know, wanting to charge stuff like interchange fees is that that network, you know, in the 90s and 80s and, and ongoing has cost billions and billions of dollars to um, build up and to uh, maintain. And of course, being healthy capitalists, which I assume everyone is in this room, um, you know, that has to get paid for somehow. So putting pressure on interchange, putting pressure on a system that pays for that ability to walk into a merchant anywhere in the world that holds one of these two logos and know that that money is going to find a way and the correct amount of money is going to be taken from your account and a bunch of other stuff that they do in between amongst frauds and all that kind of stuff, um, that has to be paid for. And, and a note on interchange, and I won't get too sort of started on it, but you know where it was trialled before they brought in the regulation uh, in Australia, in Spain, in Canada, um, it was proven before the regulation changed that the merchants did not hand any of the benefits of a reduced interchange fee back to the consumers. And not only that, they held on to the money, and not only that, the banks found their way to make their money back by reducing the level of um, uh, bonuses that you get from your credit cards, as an example, and by increasing the amount of fees that you charge on your debit card, uh, on your current account. So net-net, as consumers, bringing in this regulatory change, we're paying more, the merchants are getting more, and the banks are getting more, and the consumers are being stuffed. So just a note on some regulations which seem very good and well thought out at the time. Do not forget that the banks and the networks are run by an incredibly smart, well-funded board who will always be cleverer than the folks sitting in the European regulatory bodies. And the beauty of the three-party system is you'd think that there would be benefits of the issuer and the acquirer coming together. You'd think that, that would be cheap, but in actual fact it's not. Because American Express said, no, we'll make it more expensive because we're going to offer you a better service as a consumer, we're going to offer you a better service as a merchant. So we're going to charge you more for that. And that's uh, a big problem for them at the moment in terms of their business model. Uh, that makes us struggling at the moment. And um, I'm sure that, uh, that they'll get through it. But it's tough times for, for three-party systems at the moment. A bunch, of, a bunch of stuff outside of interchange, but also to do with the way they're being regulated has changed. Uh, and this is a snapshot of how confusing it all is. Um, and it's a small snapshot. You could make this about 50 slides. But there is loads of choice, effectively, when it comes to digital payments. There's loads of choice for the consumer. There's these big players in the middle. And, and I've tried to pull out names that, that are actually ones that you'd recognize. But there's a proliferation of them now that you, that you wouldn't. And then even on the merchant side, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff. So, you know, look, the payments industry is, is rich, it's vibrant, it's, it's interesting um, at the moment. It does go in fits and starts, uh, but th there's, a lot, there's a lot going on in a lot of different areas. And I would imagine across the board, um, you're dealing with people in various different segments. Yeah? Model up to a business 
will it be the start of money? Uh, it, it's all in it's all in this side, the acquiring side. That's where all the money is. I mean, okay, so transfer wise and people like that are doing stuff around money transfer. Uh, that's that's slightly different. But all, you know, when you look at Adyen, when you look at what Nets is doing, when you look at all of those big transactions that have taken place in the last six months, that's all acquiring. Right. You know, um, e even to the point of uh, what was so Izettle was supposed to IPO for remind me what the IPO number was. But anyway, PayPal came along and paid them double what they were going to make in their IPO. So that's insane, and no one really knows what the, what's going on there. Um, but yeah, all of the money, you know, I was saying issuing was all the money, now acquiring is where all the money is. Um, but I'm going to come to the banks in a second, because I don't think there's a huge problem for them. So this is the beginning of the story for, the, for Europe. This is what started happening in, in 1993 when the banks got very excited about us um, having uh, cards. And they've done a fantastic job. You know, really, they've done a fantastic job. You think about how we pay and the infrastructure that we have around us, how we don't even think about it, and then moving on to contactless and mobile. This all came and was born out of the investment that the banks, I'm sorry to keep banging on about, but it was the banks and the networks that did that. There was no fintech at that time. They put a load of money in, and that's why they're sort of a little bit kind of irritated about being bashed over the head all the time. Yes, they ruined the global economy, but come on, you know, they also gave us debit cards. So look, but there, there was massive growth over that period of time, and the same with the number of transactions. And so that's the kind of beginning of the digitization of payments, was this boring thing that we all still have called a debit card. Um, and now, now we start, now's the meat. Um, these are all names that I think you'll recognize, most of them, most of them. Um, a lot of them are only 10 years old, yeah? So all of these companies have built their enormous platforms and enormous networks in, in 10 years. Um, and I want to visualize that, because I'm not gonna talk through all of these things. I've got another video to show you, but I... I about 80% of spam though of that number I don't know who they are, but they they they, they knock out a mean video. Um, so imagine, <laughs> uh, so imagine that is happening every 60 seconds, right? And then imagine that someone said, "What if we could monetize a per click, a per click view on 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 all those things?" Pinterest, Pinterest. Um, you can now buy on Pinterest, WhatsApp Pay, uh, Google Pay, uh, Pay, 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 Pay. Everything's paying. And that's the reason why Adyen went from zero seven years ago to 14 billion IPO in the last week. You know, they've all seen this, but let's be very clear, payments industry is a fast follower, yeah? The fintech companies weren't there going, I know, um, let's, let's, let's pump billions, billions of dollars into something and hope that a market reacts. It's completely the other way. They're reacting to everything you've seen in that video and they're, they're, they're monetizing or helping companies monetize that. And you know, when you look over, again, sorry, it's slightly old figures, but you just get the general picture of what's been going on and the trend 
of, of where the money's going. But you know, to reiterate, they're following the trend, not, not making the trend. And of course, where's the money going? Well, the VCs and, um, uh, and uh, private equities of the world aren't stupid. They're putting the money into personal, that's us, and SMEs, which are underserved. And they're putting it into the majority of where the banks are making their money. So when you're asking about the disruption, sorry, the disruption, you know, they're, they're not doing it, well, where was it? You know, in asset management. There's no money in it. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're putting it in all the right places. And then there's the impact on the banks. You know, all the banks are going to die. There will be no banks in the future. We'll all have a thousand apps on our phone from fintech companies. That personally is not a view that I hold either. Um, uh, in 2015, so well, let's start with 2017 because that's closer. So 5% of the total banking revenue, they're saying will will that lunch will be eaten by um, by fintechs and, and disruption. So when we go back to that slide earlier on, on 4%. 4% saying that was a nice growth rate for a company, and then you think of the banks and what they have to return. 5% starts to look like an ugly number if that's being wiped off your bottom line every year. And it's not just that, because they've got the regulatory pressures. They had the, I know it's being unwind now, but um, uh, we, the, the capital requirements increased. The Dodd-Frank, was it? Or the Durban, Durban Amendment, or whatever it was. Um, you know, so they've, they've been under a load of pressure uh, they've had to make massive write downs. So 5%, yeah, manageable. 10% starts to look really ugly. And then, of course, 17% is like, that's Citibank going out of business. So, you know, in 2023, Citibank's going out of business. What are we going to do? The good news is it's fine because the biggest fintech investors out there are in actual fact banks through various different vehicles, of course. Um, but the fintech market. And sorry, all views are personal, by the way. The fintech market is is a showcase for um, for talent and for technology, um, and and they'll say that they're doing things like disrupting, and they'll say that they're trying to kill banks, and they'll say all that stuff. The only people that are going to pay them what they want for their hard work in seven, ten, fifteen years that they're doing building stuff up are the banks. They're the only people with a checkbook big enough. You know, if someone wants to buy transfer-wise now. Who's got that money, you know? And PayPal, by the way, before anyone raises it, is not really, is not really a fintech anymore, buying a fintech. PayPal, you know, PayPal's been around a long time. So, you know, all of this stuff that's going on in the market, it, it will be consolidated, that is coming. Think about what happened, with, uh, quite a few of you probably don't remember what happened in the internet um, boom. But, you know, when you look at what happened in e-commerce, who do we all talk about now? It's PayPal. That's not to say there weren't 400 other e-com providers out there just very few of them survived. And I'm not saying there will be only one, but there won't be many. There won't be many brands out there, you know, from this massive market of, of fintech companies out there. There won't be many that we look back in in 15 years time and go, wow, that was, that happened. Because they'll all be soaked up here um, and by the likes of Google and Apple and, and all those kind of guys. And a, a new trend that, that's occurring now is, um, the fintech area around platforms has kind of gone now. So people aren't looking at, wow, that's a really cool bit of tech. What they're looking at is the people that are running it. So they're buying PhDs because they can't, a bank goes to you, hey, you've got a PhD in three different things and we really like it. We're going to pay you a load of money. And they go, no, 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 it's fine. I like playing ping pong at lunchtime and I like not wearing a suit and I like wearing shorts and, you know, I don't care about your, the banking infrastructure at all. So the way they're nailing them now is by buying the companies and they're not, yes, there's some technology in there that they can use, but they probably have something of it and it might help to stack up on their, um, on their technology, but really they're buying the personnel and that's like a new trend that's just starting to occur now. Um, so the banks are thinking about it. Ah, the good old publishers. We got it completely wrong. We got it completely wrong. So um, this chart graphs, this graph charts uh, the the revenues for us publishers out there of the hard copy products. And when we failed to understand this little program over here, um, what happened was mobile advertising got launched. Then that fourth screen was one of the first mobile advertising companies to launch. Since then, there have been lots of others. Then Facebook came along, and finally, 
the death knell was Twitter. And since then, there's been a load of others, obviously, but you can see what the bottom line is. So there have been, um, there have been good examples of what not to do in terms of ignoring digitization. You know, there is, there's, there's some horrible stories out there, for us lot especially. But, you know, it's coming and it's, and it's important. Um, what are people doing with digital payments? What are people doing on mobile, on iPads, on, on, on that kind of stuff? Everything. You know, this, this chart five years ago would have looked like these ones here. Maybe this one. Mm, but nothing else. And when you look at groceries, which is only 7%, you know, that's changing now. Um, Amazon have a store which you can walk in and just walk out of when, when you've got your, your stuff. Co-op is trialing that in the UK. There's a bunch of these things happening. Um, so grocery on mobile and that kind of area. Um, who's doing delivery now? Do Amazon do grocery deliveries now? Yeah, yeah okay. So, you know, that's that number will suddenly look like 70% because that's what people are doing. Um, I think millennials is a bit dead now, isn't it? We're all kind of millennials. We've all been dragged in. Um, we're all doing stuff on our mobile. And and this this is the sort of new super trend. The the lifestyle super app is is an expectation now. All of the chats, all of the pays, all of that. They're all they're all trying to keep you sticky inside their um, little fiefdom, or in some cases very big fiefdom. And the two biggest are obviously Alipay and 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 WeChat, who have managed to get all of these elements into one single app. Um, you know, are they coming to Europe? Yes. Will they have some issues? Yes. Uh, they're not regulated like a bank, and any 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 kind of financial services that they want to de deploy into Europe, they will have to be regulated. Some of the services that they want to offer require banking or, or payment institution licenses, which makes them a regulated entity, which does create some some challenges for them. But it doesn't really matter because we have Apple Pay and we have Apple, we have Google and we have Google Pay. We we have these other things, um, and I'm th I'm sure that at some stage we'll start to bundle those into. Um, you know, into a single app because that's ultimately what, what we want as consumers. We want that kind of um, single interaction. Uh, we don't want to have a thousand apps that have got our payment details in, they've got our private details in. We're all aware of what's going on around data breaches and stuff like that. So I, I see this as I see this as something that that will happen. You know, uh, that increasing consolidation um, and, and then you factor in open banking is deliberately set up to help this as a play um, to make it easier for these. Uh, types of applications to sit uh, to make it easier for fintech companies to get in there and do their stuff you know go into your account go into your personal details aggregate that sort of stuff and hand it back as a better service either to your bank or to yourself as a consumer so that you can get on with your life and this is a this is like this is where I see it's going um, and I've got to just kind of remind myself I'll talk you through it but um, in this instance, you've got a virtual reality application sitting on your mobile phone, but as a consumer, you have to allow several things to happen here. You, you need to allow your network in, so you consider Facebook, LinkedIn, all those kinds of things. Um, you need to have filled in a bunch of personal details, which a, a third-party fintech could have done in terms of scrubbing your account and your identity and all that kind of, that kind of stuff. And you need to have consent. You need to have given your consent for all of those elements to be used by a number of different parties, all through one app. So now I'm in the process of. Uh, I'm Tom, let's say. No, I'm not Tom because he's going to that house. I'm someone else. I'm Alex, and I want to buy a house. Um, and I go to a particular area that I like, and I open up the app, and I'm able to see. So Zoopla's now factoring into this stuff. Uh, right Move, all of these different uh, purple bricks. They're all. They're all firing information into you about what houses are where, if they're part of your social network, um, what the price of that house was when it was bought, how long the people have lived there, and in, ter in turn, you're feeding back information to, uh, to um, mortgage companies, banks, uh, financial institutions saying, this is, this is who I am, this is what I earn, this is what my age is, this is what my aspirations are, these are my networks. So they're now looking at, are you going out on a Friday night and taking drugs? Are you at work during these sorts of times? What, what is your profile? And on that basis, they're going to start firing notices to you saying, we'll give you a 5.7% fixed rate now on that house that's for sale. So they're going to start doing live lending based on all of that criteria that you've allowed them 
so that you never have to go to an HSBC branch and fill in reams and reams of paper and all the other stuff you have to do now. Effecting, and then, yeah, finally, finally, um, I just, so mobile, I think, it was, is it clear? I think mobile is, is that everyone, we're going mobile. Um, so <laughs> coming back to the two points, mobile and, and cash and cashless and digital, that's four points. Um, the main thing is to just question question, question. When you get clients coming in saying, we've got this amazing mobile payment uh, platform, well, what is it? I mean, the mobile payments and mobile payments, there's about five or six different mobile payments platforms here, and they're all different. They all do something completely different. Mobile point of sale is, you know, it's mobile payment, but it's got nothing to do with uh, a wearable technology, or it's got nothing to do with QR. So, you know, those, the, my two my two key things for you were to kind of make sure you question for the sanity of, of your clients, you know, when they come in and say, yeah, we got this, it's, you're not trying to soak that away from them, but you're just trying to say, this is what the market thinks. And so on that basis, could we just try and really win a little bit? Yeah. And I'm done. Oh yeah, Bitcoin. No, I'm not done. <laughs> Bitcoin, sorry. No, I am done. Bitcoin. We, we couldn't, I couldn't not say something about Bitcoin. But it's not a payments platform yet. Yay. Oh.